Good morning, everyone, and thank you for making it and joining us for this first raining and snowing day. So thank you for being here today. And uh, some of our speakers made it also. Some came from Central Asia, some came from uh, uh, Europe, some came uh, uh, for, from other uh, uh, US cities, but unfortunately, uh, Alexander Kule from uh, Columbia University didn't make it because he's playing a uh, plane from New York who Arkansas this morning, and so he wasn't, he will not be able to join us, and he was really uh, sorry for that. So that's the first time we're organizing an event uh, related on the, uh, uh, UAE, or, or, I mean, how would you discuss this interaction between the political aspect and the economic one? So I don't know who wants to begin. Maybe I'll start, if that's okay. You have to buy um, all right, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I thought about that question and, you know, and, um, I don't think it's possible to separate the two when you talk about Russia's perspective. I mean, I think it really goes back to the old phrase with Marty and the people are one. That from the point of, of view of Russia, economic integration and close political relationships are, it's both, let me think how to put it, they're inseparable. And for Russia, they represent what, or at least for Putin, they represent what he would see as a natural state. That any set of relationships in which Kazakhstan in particular, um, but the other states to varying degrees, are inter to the degree which they are not integrated with Russia, that's unnatural. And what the, what the Eurasian community is, from the Russian viewpoint, been trying to do is to take a relationship which in their minds has been unnatural for a decade or more, and as, you know, starting not immediately at the time of the class, and try to restore it to naturalness. And then, I know we'll talk later about Ukraine, but, but <clears throat> the situation in Ukraine just emphasizes I mean, it, it underlines the, the belief of what Russia sees as, as its right um, and, and the degree to which the, the community is intended to achieve that. Thank you. So I'm, I'm here on behalf of Ambassador Bill Courtney, the president of the U.S. Kazakhstan Business Association today. So I have some remarks from him and then we had to add in just the along the way. Um, but some remarks from Bill Courtney on this is that Russia is using several inducements to persuade the neighbors to join the EU. Um, it says that member states qualify for subsidized gas prices, a major incentive for Belarus. Last April, as Kyrgyzstan pledged to join the Union, Gazprom brought the country's gas network and pledged a stable gas supply. In August, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced that Russia would provide $500 million to speed Kyrgyzstan's integration. Um, but border disputes between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are slowing their entrance. Um, so it really is an effort to bring the region back together in this way. Um, we think that the success of the EU will depend on the extent to which it reduces the role of politics in commerce and increases their role based regulation that promotes market competition and efficiency. So keeping it focused on economics rather than the politics. Um, Throughout to precise regulation will benefit smaller players, and WTO participation by the member states um, will reinforce the EU's rules-based operations. Um, thank you so much. I I'm really happy to be here. Um, I think for me the difference is here between intentions and outcomes. And while we may or may not know something about intentions, sometimes it's more important just to look at what the result was, because there may be unintended outcomes as well. And I guess a lot of what's happening the Eurasian Economic Union, just because there are many players engaged in their decision making, is to some extent not intended for any of them to happen exactly in this way. So in terms of intentions, I would entirely agree with you that for Russia, at least economic and political motivation are inseparable. Um, I would even go as far as to say that for Russia, political motivation dominates. In fact, of all of these countries, Russia is the one for which it is most difficult to create a compelling explanation of economic gains from the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, however, whatever the motivation was, if we look at the final product, 
as it materialized after negotiations, after Kazakhstan's position on the Eurasian Economic Union, which cut a lot of attempts of political cooperation, which were promoted. We have an organization which is purely economic. It's even more economic than the CIS, for example, which is very cautiously avoiding any flavor of ideologization. I mean, there is no reference to Eurasianism in any document written in the Eurasian Economic Union. There is no reference to, to anything except well-being and, and improving economic ties. And which is nothing more and nothing less than a customs union with uh, some elements of supranational decision-making in the Eurasian Economic Commission and with very, very ambitious plans which most likely will not materialize, which have been written in the Eurasian Economic Union Treaty as such. Being a customs union, it obviously has an important impact on how economic ties between the countries look like, and one can talk about pros and cons, which we can do it later. Uh, but I think it's also important to distinguish different ways how Russia could affect or not affect the countries it deals with and how these countries interact with each other from the specific effect associated with the customs union. Um, if a country emulates Russian <coughs> managed democracy, whatever you would call the system which Russia has, it doesn't necessarily happen because it's a member of the Eurasian Economic Union. It just happens because Russia has an impact. And the Eurasian Economic Union is just a customs union. Nothing more, nothing less. If I may continue on that uh, issue, would you say that, in a sense, the, is that a victory of the other member state to be able to transform the politically motivated Eurasian Union from the Russian side to something that would be purely economic and that would be something that then from because I, I'm thinking about the, the the section of the Russian political uh, elite those who have kind of ethno-nationalist motivation who are uh, discussing in Russia the fact that the Eurasian Union uh, is something that would be very costly for Russia and then that there is an economic price to pay for Russia the political domination or control over the region. So can we articulate the discussion of, around this element? Yeah, I, I, I think, I don't want to phrase it as victory or defeat because the Eurasian Economic Union, precisely because it's so ideological as it is, can be framed in any way you want. There are those in Russia who would describe the Eurasian Economic Union as our strategic project against the West. There are those in Russia, in the same Eurasian Economic Commission, if you talk to people there, you have, you have everybody who would say it's just an attempt to become part of the international uh, uh, global community where you have to import norms from the EU, we have to uh, become narrow to the EU, this one, Vladivostok, and so on. So you can turn it any way you want. Uh, I think, however, that to some extent, the fact that the Eurasian Economic Union does not include any explicit political provisions is a success of countries which clearly didn't want to have it, and that was Kazakhstan which uh, quite openly expressed the opinion that, even, let me give you just a very small example of this. It's very hard to find an international organization which doesn't have an interparliamentary assembly today, even including those which are having no real impact in any sense. The Eurasian Economic Union doesn't have an interparliamentary assembly, partly because Kazakhstan protested against that, because it resembled a little bit of political integration. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm trying to think how to put it. I think that, I mean, it's very hard for me at this stage to talk about what the economic union is doing or not doing, because it's, it, it's really there, you know. I can talk a lot more about what the customs union between Russia and Kazakhstan did, because I lived under it, you know, on the Kazakh side of the border. Um, and that's why, for me, the notion of this being more costly for Russia, it's not clear to me it's going to be more costly. To date, it's been more costly for Kazakhstan than it is for Russia. I mean, it depends on how you're going to define cost. Um, but, it, but certainly the perception in Kazakhstan is that it has been more costly for Kazakhstan than it has been for Russia. It's, it's reshaping some of the patterns of Kazakh trade in a way that the country wouldn't like it reshaped. The WTO hasn't gone away as a problem fully yet. I mean, we don't know how it's going to work when Kazakhstan gets in. Um, watching the customs union on the ground 
it, it is an organization that when you look at it on paper and then you look at the application of certain trade facilitation issues, because I did a project on standards last year, when technical reg regulations, you know, these are being defined in ways that, that do not, they haven't moved towards free trade. It's, it, it really still is a trade organization in which Russia's economic interests dominate. Um, I think that the Kazakhs have gone a long way in redefining the union. I think that Kazakhs have really changed their minds about the union. That at first, there were people that were for it and people that were against it for economic reasons. I mean, there were strong economic arguments in Kazakhstan on the question of it. And over time, the number of people who saw positive economic gain began to decrease in numbers. And then Ukraine occurs. Um, and so for Kazakhstan to be able, for, for Kazakh economists to be able to fully articulate and press the, for further redefinitions or to bring up the sense of grievance on particular issues, that becomes political today. It becomes a political risk today. So where in 2013 and 2014, whereas in 2013 when it first came in, you could have a wide debate on these questions in an apolitical way, now to have that same kind of debate has political risk attached to it. And that to me is a big change, and that clearly works to Russia's long-term benefit. If I could throw in one other point, I think that from a Russian viewpoint, or at least from the entourage around Putin's viewpoint, economics drives politics. So even in a purely economic union, in the end, there would be, if you can dominate the economy of these countries, you will down, in their perception, you will down the road have a much greater ability to dominate their political life as well. Whether, you know, whether they're right or not, that's a different question and for a different meeting. But I think that's definitely the perspective. I think another issue that, that comes in on this is that Russian's economic policies are fairly protectionist. Um, so once we're trying to coordinate and join the Eurasian Economic Union, countries are having to raise some of these custom tariffs and, and trade barriers, which Kazakhstan is now dealing with in, in WTO negotiations. So balancing those two things um, is another and economic challenge. So, Marta, you mentioned uh, the Ukrainian crisis, and of course, I think we cannot avoid it. It's a little bit the elephant in the room. So, the, the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on our perception and the local perception of the Eurasian Economic Union, and clearly, Ukraine is lost as a country uh, uh, um, uh, for Russia. It will not be, or that would be a drastic change. It will not become a member of the Eurasian Economic Union. And of course, that was one of the big uh, uh, the big part that was interesting economically and politically for Russia to get the one that was making giving sense to the Eurasian uh, Union project, having both Ukraine and Kazakhstan. So now part of the the the, the pie is lost, and it also means that uh, 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 except Kazakhstan, Russia is doing with is dealing for the Eurasian Economic Union with a lot of small countries whose economic interest for Russia are relatively limited with the Ukrainian. So how do you think we should articulate this Ukrainian crisis and its relationship to the, to the Eurasian Union? Um, I think I wouldn't accept that Ukraine is lost to the Eurasian Union. It's certainly lost today, but I think that the Eurasian Union can only function with Ukraine in it. I think it will eventually be defunct if, if Ukraine doesn't join it, or it will take on a very, I mean, it doesn't have to disappear but it, it will become something very different and much less integrative. Because you're right, the, the other economies are much smaller, um, with the exception of Russia. I do think that Belarusian-Kazakhstan nexus is an interesting one. I think there's a lot more coordination between these two countries on some issues. Lukashenko has clearly led. On other issues, Nazarbayev has led. But I think that these two leaders have, have become closer as a result of this, I don't mean with their pals, but I think that they they believe that they have to that, that they have, if not an explicit alliance, an implicit alliance. Um, but I think for for Russia, one of the things would be to control everybody's trade with China too, and that's the one thing these smaller economies do do. They all trade with China, and for Kyrgyzstan, 
the terms of entry are, are really critical. It's going to destroy, if they come in on anything like Kazakhstan's terms, it destroys Kyrgyz trade with China. Um, because Kyrgyz WTO terms are totally different, and they're going to have to abrogate them, and that's very, very difficult. So I think that's another plus from the Russian point of view, that, that Russia then manages everybody's trade relations with China rather than them, them managing it themselves. Um, a couple of points. First of all, if we look empirically at how the common customs tariff was set, there was indeed a major impact of Russia, that's true, but there are also studies which emphasize that we somewhat overestimate this impact. That if the negotiations were just going, we would get to something that is very similar to what we have. Um, now, what does the Ukrainian uh, crisis mean? First of all, I do believe that Ukraine is lost for the Eurasian Economic Union forever. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem for the Eurasian economy. It depends upon what you want to achieve. If you um, ideologically fill this economic construction, then for sure, without Ukraine, it's not what the goal was. It's uh, not in any way a political powerful bloc. But if your goal <laughs> is just to um, encourage economic cooperation, you could do it in this format as well. The question is about how you do it. And here, the cru crucial issue, and uh, this will be the second point, is. There have been many studies about the effects of the Eurasian Economic Union. And I think the semi-consensus seems to be that, as of now, it is having a small negative effect on most economies, including Kazakhstan. It could have a positive effect if and only if non-tariff barriers were removed. This was supposed to be the second step, which is probably not going to happen, precisely because of the Ukrainian crisis. Because the Ukrainian crisis changed two things. The first one, it made Russia way more assertive in unilaterally changing the rules of the game. Things like foodstuff sanctions. So now, the area where Russia believes it's a political point, we don't care about whoever thinks about it, have to do it, are way larger than they were before. The second thing which the crisis changed is generally much more protectionist attitude of Russia, which is partly already violating the rules of the Eurasian Economic Union. It has been a big problem for Belarus which de facto had to reinstall custom controls and exports in December. Uh, so from this point of view, uh, the crisis massively undermines precisely the credibility of what I was showing at the beginning, of being just the customs union. Uh, and then the third point, of course, the big Russian crisis, right, which is also affecting all other countries in different ways and creating uh, additional challenges for them. Uh, so I would say Eurasian Economic Union is now certainly facing major challenge. It is questionable whether it's going to disintegrate, probably not. But whether it's become a rhetorical construction, it is absolutely possible. It will very much depend upon how much Russia will assertively change the rules of the game unilaterally. What, as of now, we cannot estimate. We don't know this. I agree with you. Um, I don't see disintegration as a problem. I think it's Facing, but I do think that Russia's choice to use force in Ukraine is an element for the governance of the Eurasian Economic Union as a whole. Um, they need to realize that if they want the Union to succeed and endure, it has to be fairly governed and it has to be a rules based organization based on those economic principles. I, I want to come back to the question of Ukraine and what if they're not members of does. I mean, I don't, I don't think that the, the Union, the Eurasian Economic Union can disintegrate today or anything. It's too great a loss for Russia. It will be propped up no matter what. I mean, it's going to continue to exist. But the, the difference with not having Ukraine is the size of that economy being taken out of it and the way decisions are made in there and the, you know, that it has to do with the, the size of the economy and the size of the GDP. And it, it, it change, as long as Ukraine's not in there, it, it is a totally Russian-dominated organization. May? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, I think we have to look about the formal and the informal governance of the Union. The formal governance of the Union, as we know, is de jure uh, consensus rule in, in the upper part, in the upper chamber of the Eurasian Commission, and a simple majority rule in, in the uh, lower, lower chamber, which is de facto operating on consensus as well. From this point of view, actually what we see now with the commission being changed, with new members being invited from Kyrgyzstan and from Armenia, and uh, again on the same territory, doesn't really give Russia so much of the power.
power this. And in fact, what we have seen in the Commission, I have heard reports of this from people who work in the Commission, and there have been many cases when Kazakhstan blocked economic decisions, which it found to be uh, unacceptable for it. And one case which probably everybody have followed is the Russian attempts to impose custom duties on Ukraine, which Kazakhstan and Belarus blocked as part of the Eurasian economy. Now, what could happen was that Russia simply disregards the rules of the Union and acts on its own. This is happening way more often now. And uh, from this point of view, indeed, one can say we're looking at a new Russia which makes the benefits of being part of the Union much smaller, which makes this rhetorical sustaining by these banks of non-functioning much more likely. Um, in terms of Ukraine being such a necessary part of the Eurasian Economic Union, well, larger markets, of course, better than smaller markets. But uh, I think there are clear economic benefits from, let me put it like this, if Eurasian Economic Union were to work, as it was supposed to be beginning, meaning non-tariff barriers were to abolish, there would be clear benefits from the members from the current consideration as well. The, the, the smallest benefits for Russia, as I said, but for Kazakhstan, one can devise a number. It doesn't work like this, and it probably will not work. But from this point of view, whether you have Ukraine or not, it's not crucial. What's crucial is uh, how much of the internal government structure actually works like it was supposed to work. May I add a kind of uh, simple uh, question about the, the risk of the Eurasian Economic Union becoming a kind of purely rhetorical, empty uh, thing? How much is that, and I mean, I know that the kind of question where you don't have the answer, but how much is that linked to the personality of the three presidents? I mean, what happened? I mean, are the projects so much personalized around Putin, Lukashenko, and, and, and Nazarbayev that one of the three of them missing would suddenly change the balance? Or is that, because we tend to always kind of over-personalize our perception of how the regimes function. So I was wondering, because it's the three of them are so much important symbolically, when you see the three of them, they are, they are, I mean, they are not neutral personality figures. So how much is that linked to their own personality? Or is that maybe not the right way to formulate the question? Yes. Uh, I would say it almost the opposite. I would say that I would see one of the drivers of the union from Russia's point of view was to institutionalize relationships so they wouldn't be dependent on these guys being eternal. Um, and and the best chance from the Russian viewpoint would have been to do it under somebody like Nazarbayev, who sees the strategic relationship between Kazakhstan and Russia as, as inviolable. I mean, it can be redefined constantly, but it's just a, a necessary part of Kazakhstan life. I would agree. I think that um, Kazakhstan views this as an important part of their multi sector policy, both foreign and economic. And if it works, it should, in the, some of the non-tariff and the areas go down, trade with China through Kazakhstan um, is an important thing that will grow. For example, the, the railway that China is investing in building east to west through Kazakhstan will, um, I think it will like, bring the transit time down by a third, as opposed to current water routes. So things like that in the future could be a huge benefit and are things that be institutionalized. Um, I think, first of all, two of these three presidents are not going to in any foreseeable future. Uh, this is very clear. So uh, here we, we simply don't have any answer. We don't have, I mean, we have to live with Lukashenko and, and Putin, I don't know, at least for 10 years. This is just, you know, average assessment of the lifespan of a uh, Soviet president. It's the only reason why I'm saying 10 years and not 30. Uh, Kazakhstan is, of course, different, precisely for the reasons of the average lifespan of the no Soviet president. So uh, here, I think to some extent it was indeed an attempt to use the um, more attractive um, situation on, on the side of the other country. But I'm also not sure that without Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan would massively break from the multi vector policy. Uh, no, I'm not so uh, I don't know. I, quite frankly, I think that at this stage, I mean, the cautious answer is we can't distinguish personality and other logic in these countries at all. Uh, the less cautious answer is. I don't think personality matters that much. Can I throw something on the table that we haven't had on the table yet? And this isn't a product of the union, but it's something that's affecting the union, which is the, the ruble tango <coughs> exchange and, and the fact that the ruble is, has lost value faster than the tango and that there's 
pressure to devalue the tenge again. And that, and this is one of the things that is damaging trade balance from the Kazakh viewpoint. In the past week, I mean, I'm reading one of the Kazakh sites I was on, you know, for the first time they were, there, there are grocery stores that will, you call up an order from Kazakhstan, and they fill your order from Omsk, you know, and ship it, to, bring it to your house. Um, it's really, the, the, this current relationship right now is, between the currencies, is really, I think, going to shape the economic relations between the countries more than the union itself. I'd be really curious. Other people's response. Yeah, actually, and this is very much bringing us to another point, which you guys suggested we have to talk this in the Russian crisis, uh, because uh, all, almost all, all, all member countries of the customs union and of the Eurasian Economic Union, and quite a few which are not members of the Eurasian Economic Union, will be massively affected by the Russian crisis. Kazakhstan is actually among the countries which are the least affected relatively to all other countries. At least it doesn't have half of the GDP remittances from oh, yeah. coming, coming from Russia. That's that's already better. Um, their devaluation of, of ruble, which created exactly the effect that you have described, and not for the first time, but have the no. same in 1998. Uh, we know what a good time that was. Yeah. So I think customs union plays a role here. Eurasian Economic Union again, but it's it's really a customs union, nothing more. It plays a role in one important respect. It restricts policy options Kazakhstan has as a response. So what Kazakhstan did in 1998, as you remember, was imposing duties, customs duties, was restricting import production. There was a discussion about similar response in Kazakhstan, leaking to the media very recently, but it is now much more difficult, <laughs> simply because many decisions are legally made by the Eurasian Economic Commission. So either you just break the rules of the union at all, for what Kazakhstan is probably not ready at this moment, or you will suffer from this competitive devaluation, or you will have to value it in yet, which is also an option, I think, which is very likely to happen, with consequences for other trade partners of Kazakhstan. So here, and this is actually applying to many countries in the region, customs union restricts policy options and increases the chance that the, the risks are important. Maybe can we continue on the, the more maybe on the economic crisis and the impact it's also having on, on the remittances and on the kind of also popular support for in, in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. I mean, the sociological surveys we have really show that families with migrants, which means a large majority of the population, are relatively much more in favor of integrating the Eurasian Economic Union than those who don't have um, uh, uh, migrants because, they, of course, the kind of uh, um, uh, everyday uh, uh, interpretation for uh, an average citizen of what means in, uh, his country entering the Eurasian Economic Union is the feeling that there will be a, a larger uh, uh, freedom of movement and of registration uh, uh, to work in Russia, and especially the fact that Russia introduced this new uh, law for migrants, the patent system, the exam for uh, on uh, Russian language and Russian uh, uh, culture. So how do you think it's really shaping the, the Tajik and the Kyrgyz uh, uh, room of manoeuvre? Uh, first of all, two key countries which are sending migrants to Russia, I mean quantitatively, which are Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, are not part of the customs union of the Eurasian Economic Union. As of now, Uzbekistan will never be, it's not on the table, and for Tajikistan we know that the discussion is, is more difficult than it was for Kyrgyzstan. And these are the countries which sent most of the migrants, these are the countries where most of the migrants are going home. So we have already statistics that about 300,000 uh, migrants from Uzbekistan returned, to, to, to Uzbekistan last year. I think there are about 2 million in Russia as of now. There's about 1 million of Tajik migrants with about 100,000 returning back. This is Russian uh, official statistics, which may be wrong. But, uh, uh, for other countries, <coughs> yes, hypothetically, the Eurasian Economic Union is, uh, is supposed to, to ensure freedom of labor, mobility of labor. It won't, because the question is how it will be enforced on site in Russia. Given the overall level of xenophobia in Russia, given the general attitude of Russian bureaucracy, the quality of work of Russian bureaucracy, it's extremely unlikely that it will really, I mean, there is no real freedom of movement within Russia to some extent. So why we should we expect anything else happening to, to other countries? And the second point is, if economic crisis progresses, and we have absolutely no reason to expect things are going to be better, it will be worse, then migrants will be going back. And therefore, 
the, economic, the, the, the Eurasian Economic Union benefits will simply become less important to them because the Russian market will be less attractive for them to work in the first place. I, I agree entirely, and, I think, and that's why it's really important to distinguish between the theoretical possibilities of what the customs union could have meant for people and what the realities of the economies of 2015, 2016 are going to be. Um, Russia is not going to dig itself out of this crisis uh, the value of the legal remittances are going to continue to drop, not just because the number of people are going home, but because the value of the ruble has dropped. And, that's, and I don't see it a way that these countries are going to be able to compensate for the economic blow that they are getting from Russia. So I don't see what Russia, in, in a desire to not look like Russia's retreating but advancing, I don't see what Russia can put on the table to try to ameliorate these social concerns in, in the three countries, and, and in Kazakhstan too, because some of the migrant labor comes there. I mean, so there's this much bigger discussion in the Kazakh press now about the impact of the Russian economic crisis on, on labor migration in the other countries and what it's going to mean for Kazakhstan. But, but I don't see solutions available. I mean, they can push for more people to join the union, but they're not going to give them anything from it. Um, it's not going to lead to improvements in their life. It's not going to lead to improved trade. It's going it's to give them more negative trade balances. With the, and, and so I, I just see a deepening crisis that there's not even a rhetoric to deal with, let alone substantive solutions. Another, another side to that is, um, besides the impact on the GDP of these places who are dependent on remittances, could be to labor shortages in the places that they're coming from, um, which will hurt economic productivity in areas of the union as well. Something that we need to watch out for. There are also other channels how prices will be transmitted. First of all, all these countries also trade with Russia quite a lot. Again, Kazakhstan is the least vulnerable. It has a relatively large share of Russian imports, but exports are relatively a very small the smallest they think it is, one of the smallest. But for Tajikistan, or for Belarus, of course, this is a very different uh, level of risk. And then there's an issue of direct Russian subsidies. I mean, the anti-crisis fund for the Eurozec was just renamed into something like Eurozec, Eurasian Stability Fund, if I'm not mistaken. But I don't, I can't imagine how Russia could provide large-scale subsidies to other countries in the foreseeable future, which creates a huge problem. First of all, the problem about internal social and political stability of these countries, <coughs> where migrants are going to return. And these are not only Central Asian countries, it's also Moldova, for example. The second point is whom the migrants are going to blame, and their meaning, of course. Uh, Azerbaijan actually much less, you know, that there is a, and, and Azerbaijan doesn't depend on migrant remittances in terms of Armenia. Armenia, there are 60%, I think, of it. It has the highest share of the population living in Russia, yeah. according Very to official much. statistics. The question is whom the migrants who are going back are going to blame for what's happening. Because they all are recipients of the same Russian propaganda, which very well explains what created this crisis. And this is the, the West, the, 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 the enemy there. So if they go home and know for sure that they lost their jobs because of the West, I don't know what the reaction will be, how it will change the domestic political landscapes. And what about the, the fact that migrants are also a kind of large resilience capacity and probably many of them will try to stay in Russia and even being ready to send less money, less remittances, and which is already the case. So we also, I mean, what does that mean for the Russian economy and also for the high level of corruption of every uh, uh, Russian administration linked to the migrant, the fact that probably because of the crisis and uh, because of the, the, the new regulation for migration, we will just have a huge number of migrants staying in Russia and really working more and more in the shadow economy uh, uh, and becoming more and more kind of underground uh, uh, people. Do you see that as something that would really also undermine uh, uh, globally uh, how things are going on in Russia? Or is that the kind of side effect that is not so important? I mean, that's important for migrants themselves. <coughs> I mean, we have so, we've listed so many awful things. <laughs> then the question is where this goes on the, on the staircase of awfulness. You know, it seems like there are much more basic problems for the Russian economy than the migrants. But certainly for the countries, that the sending countries, the migrants, the, the problem of the migrants is 
is really serious. I mean, for the Russians, if you have an increasing um, shadow, underground people and shadow people, then it just becomes a way that um, ultra-nationalists, it gives them more, more juice or meat for their criticisms. <coughs> but I don't know that this is going to be the major economic problem for Russia. Uh, three small points. The first one about migration through migrants' resilience. We have seen it in 2009 with the previous crisis. There is evidence that they just stayed in Russia and didn't go back. The big difference between the crisis then and the crisis now is that it was a short you know, U-shaped crisis. And now we're going to have a very long-term L-shape. So again, sorry about all the things. Okay. And uh, if this is the case, so if you have systematic reduction of demand for labor, it will be way more harder for migrants to stay even in the shadow economy. It also depends a little bit upon which part of Russia is hit more by the crisis. And it looks like that as of now, crisis will particularly hit um, what is looking like a Russian middle class, the service sector in large cities in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So again, I don't think we, we see a lot of uh, direct options for migrants to stay here. But of course, they will try to stay. If the crisis goes on, I think at some point of time, they will have to go back. The second point about ultra-nationalists. I think with the current anti-Western rhetoric, with everything that is going to Ukraine, um, migrant issue is really a minor issue for, for the Russian nationalists. Uh, you, you have plenty of news from Donbass. Uh, you have 2.5 million Ukrainians in Russia, by the way, of, of which about 1 million are, according to official statistics again, refugees from Donbass. So this is a much, much bigger topic than anything to us. It's a so deep central issue. The third point, um, the extent to which the shadow economy will develop will also very much depend upon how Russian bureaucracy will transform by the crisis. This is a big unknown, because Russia heavily incentivized bureaucrats in the last five to ten years through payment systems and through very tough monitoring. It is very likely that the crisis will make this incentivization very difficult. So how the bureaucrats will respond by increasing corruption, by just not doing anything, very possible for Russian bureaucrats. <laughs> we don't know. And this will depend upon the options shadow economy will have. Uh, turning back to Kazakhstan specifically and US business um, and other involvement in Kazakhstan, I think that I'm a little bit more positive, but also it's a good time to encourage and support the, the continuance and strength of the multi-sectoral economic policy and focus on education, not only in terms of the propaganda that they're seeing every, all the time from Russia, but um, the different languages, the, the labor sector in the different um, areas, and also increasing the U.S. business involvement and the investment throughout the region, but Kazakhstan specifically is um, what I work in. Um, that is a good way to reinforce the rules-based economy, the, um, the, the Western business practices that, that we want them to balance these potential corruption issues with. And if I may, last question before opening uh, the floor uh, to the room. This city is always full of discussion about region, Central Asian regional integration or regional integration between Central Asia and, and more southern neighbor. And as it seems we are a city with no institutional memory, we are kind of discovering the real every two years. So every two years we suddenly realize that that would be good if the Central Asian countries could work together. And, and integrate, and then suddenly we discover that, and then after we are disappointed because that doesn't work. And so, how do you think? I mean, uh, um, how do you think for Central Asian countries, and of course, Kazakhstan is maybe the key one. I mean, this the, the kind of alternate path or parallel path between Eurasian integration and Central Asian integration can this be? Can we see a kind of shift on the way? Potentially, Kazakhstan could look at the other Central Asian countries, or more globally, the region. Could uh, try to develop more uh, uh, internal Central Asia and regional integration, and how do we articulate that to this U.S. Silk Road narrative about we need to link Central Asia to South Asia and so on, with a kind of total silence about everything we have just been discussing now that are really the important things that are shaping the realities in the region. Yes. Um, I I have several separate points that. The first is, I'd like to go back to your starting comment that these are five really different countries. Um, if 20 years ago you could be dropped down in a suburb, you wouldn't know what country you're in. Today, if you're dropped down in a suburb, 
you immediately know which country you're in. The five are really quite distinct. Um, and so even talking about integration is much more difficult. I accept that, especially for Kazakhstan, and especially with you know the, the current foreign policy of Kazakhstan, it's not just multi-vector. It is an attempt to, to create means of integration. I, I don't, I hate the word integration. Cooperation would be the term that I think is more accurately describes what they're trying to do. Enhance cooperation between the countries as a balance to, to Russia. And to a lesser extent, the balance to China, because I don't, we haven't really talked much about China here, but China's really critical to this story, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is really critical to this story. Um, but it's, yeah, to have as many different, to have a circus that has as many, a three-ring circus and not a one-ring circus like they had in, in post-Soviet space. I, I don't see that the capacity for integration within Central Asia has really it's been enhanced. If anything, it's gotten harder. I think there are forms of cooperation that are more likely now than might have been a few years ago, but but it's a real threshold always to get over. And I think as we talk, as we move forward, I think we really have to be aware that each of these countries is go going to be going through, already beginning, a period of major social crisis. And that's going to be shaping everybody's policies in each of these five countries. And so some aspects of the social crisis will um, will cause them to become more inclusive, but others are really going to press them to close borders. And, and I just want to clear up something Sarah said about, you know, like education and, and business and stuff. One of the big impacts of this current year is that people can't balance their budget. And education money has been dramatically cut. Um, and so, you know, I think we really have to think about these countries in terms of our own budget struggles in the U.S. It's not, they don't have the same democratic structures, but they have all the same competing interests fighting for the limited money. And that money is going to become more and more limited. Um, I agree. I think that um, within the region, it might not be in Central Asian, not integration, in cooperation. But I think that all of the countries in Central Asia are looking for ways to interact more globally. Um, both the, the U.S. Silk Road policy, China's Silk Road policy, um, the continuation and the evolution of the Northern Distribution Network. I think there's signals that all of them are not only looking for ways to work better together, make, but make those outreach opportunities with the rest of the world possible. Uh, yeah, I can only agree with what, what you said. I am quite frankly not sure at all that Central Asia as a region is a reasonable concept to study. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for in terms of cooperation, it, may, it makes no sense economically because these countries are way more related to Russia and or to China than to each other. There's, there's very little room for this politically because there nothing changed. We have the same presidents who tried to agree, who, who didn't try to agree, but who sometimes <laughs> used the integration rhetoric in the last 20 years and didn't move nowhere. Except they have now less trust in each other than they had 20 years ago, if it's possible. And um, I also have substantial doubts about the, at least the U.S. approach policy, quite often, quite frankly, because I also see no economic rationale here as to tying Central Asia to uh, South Asia. China's approach policy is another matter because there is an economic rationale emerging from this. So no, I mean, no, no Central Asian economic cooperation. I guess not in any foreseeable future. 